beautiful. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. If you've missed any previous episodes, you can find us on YouTube channel under my name. There's over 100 podcast interviews with experts like our expert today, who I'm super excited to introduce. And we just got to know each other briefly now, and we're introduced by a friend, but I'm super excited to dive deeper today. Um, Dr. Prodromos is an international leader in the use of stem cell and platelet-rich plasma PRP uh, treatment. He's performed more than 3,000 stem cell and platelet-rich plasma treatments for arthritis, tendon injuries, and related disorders as part of a prospective study that is the largest study by an orthopedic surgeon in existence to our knowledge. So super excited that you're doing the research as well. Um, Dr. Prodromos received his bachelor's degree with honors from Princeton University and his medical doctorate degree from John Hopkins Medical School. He served his surgical internship at the University of Chicago. We're both from Illinois uh, at some point there with medical training and um, his orthopedic surgical residency at Rush University and his fellowship in orthopedics and sports medicine at the Harvard Medical School and Mass General Hospital. He's board certified in orthopedic surgery and is the editor of a major textbook for orthopedic surgeons on the ACL. He's a founding member of the American College of Regenerative Medicine and chairman of its institutional review board. He served as an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Rush University for 27 years before stepping back to focus on foundation and stem cell work. Um, Dr. Perdomos, it's an honor and delight to get to know you here, and thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks so much for doing this. It's, it's so great that you work to get useful information out. You're welcome. And, you know, we were just talking before how passionate we are about really like root cause, functional, integrative, and, and why, I don't want to go deep into this, but our system, many people have felt this is, is not great at getting to root cause. And I don't want to bad mouth because we've both been trained in some of the best institutes of, of the United States in medicine. But the truth is we often are trained with get a label, get an ICD-10, and then we stop there and we give a medicine for that ill, or we prescribe a surgery, all totally appropriate. But the deeper stuff that we're doing and that I want to interview on is really getting to the root cause and actually solving the problem versus just putting a Band-Aid on it. Um, I want to hear, though, first, your journey. Um, where did you grow up and how did you get into medicine? Tell us a little bit about how did you get this? Um, I grew up in the in the Chicago Burbs, and I just I liked science when I was a kid. And that, nothing more to it than that. I just thought it'd be interesting. Cool. And what a career. And then orthopedics, how did that intrigue your interest as far as the... Well, it's kind of interesting because when I was at Hopkins and deciding what I wanted to do. I, I I liked the idea of being a physician as well as a surgeon and orthopedics appealed to me because you're a surgeon, but you don't just have to operate on people. And it's kind of ironic because the field in the 38 years that I've been doing it has gotten much more surgical than it was. And so one of the reasons that uh, PRP and stem cell work appeals to me is it's a way to get people better without surgery. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it was, an, it was an opportunity to take a huge area of medicine and try to know everything about it. Amazing. And what many people who listen maybe don't know, but we in medicine do know is it's a highly competitive field. So that means you were obviously very academically um, astute and, and uh, in the in the realm of you were, you know, a, an exceller, a stellar student to get into orthopedics, especially in the institutions that you did. Um, so when did you really shift from just surgery, kind of the typical orthopedic practice into the more anti-aging and stem cell and some of this kinds of stuff? How long have you been doing that? <laughs> So I was a sports medicine guy for my fellowship at, 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 at Harvard and um, was heavily into that, had a, a narrow practice doing knee and shoulder surgery, editor of the textbook on the ACL for orthopedic surgeons. So I spent most of my career doing that. And in 2009, I read about the late Kobe Bryant getting an injection of platelet-rich plasma and seemed to get better. And so we researched it and I established a, non, a 501c3 nonprofit foundation in 2003. And I published extensively and hired researchers so we could, you know, I was just always interested in evidence-based medicine. So I, I charged one of my research people and I said, why don't we learn about this? And she did, and it sounded interesting. So I started doing it first one in December of 2010. And there's, you know, most musculoskeletal problems don't need surgery, but we're surgeons, right? So sometimes we operate maybe even when we shouldn't. So, so I injected a few people with some knee problems and they got remarkably better. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. So I started doing more and more of it. We started, we're up to 5,000 patients now, a wow. prospective huge study and people just did well. So I was doing that. And I was publishing, and actually then I was solicited by a guy who was one of the pioneers of stem cell work in orthopedics in the country, who people wanted to franchise him, and he said, you're an academic guy, why don't you join me? So he kind of introduced me to it, and I became interested in stem cell work and started reading about it, and it's the same 
kind of thing. It's a way to uh, try to heal things um, without surgery. And then as time went on, I just started doing more and more of both. Excuse me, and um, um, and just and just became fascinated by it. Wow. And again, I've got quite a bit of experience with patients having that. Obviously, I don't do that in clinic at all. I leave it to you guys, the experts. But tell us more about um, first PRP and then stem cells. I know they're similar. What actually happens with the immune system when you inject your own platelets? So so when you inject your platelets, they have growth factors and anti-inflammatory cytokines. So there's no drug that has growth factors that helps you heal. And the anti-inflammatory cytokines quiet inflammation in joints in a beneficial way, unlike cortisone, for example, which kills cartilage. And stem cells work sort of similarly. And I should tell you too, you know, my, my journey was originally PRP for orthopedic problems, then stem cell for orthopedic problems, and then like arthritis and osteoarthritis, and then stem cells for inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease, and then other autoimmune diseases to the point now where most of the stem cell work that I do really isn't orthopedic. We have great success with back problems and joints, but do are involved in some things that are just amazing um, with, you know, with MS, with spinal yeah. cord injury, with autism, other things. Um, <clears throat> so, but, but, but the short answer is that's what they do. They help heal disorders, which no drug does and which no, you know, I mean, surgery, we can put joints back together. We can't make it heal. Yeah. Gosh. And it makes sense because we're using our own immune system, doing what it's supposed to do, just, uh, you yeah. know, accentuated at the site. Right. Um, what would you, why would you choose PRP yeah. over stem cell or stem cell over PRP in a certain situation? Like give us some examples of uses uh, of when a patient might well, choose. So, so none of this, none of this fits the pharma model of medicine, which kind of dominates everything. And so, um, so none of it's reimbursed. So we do a PRP injection and charge about $750 for an injection. That's a lot of money, but we have great success even with single injections. Stem cell treatments are on the order of $20,000. So I get people calling me from all over the country, all over the world, actually, and they've read about our stem cell work. And I got featured by Tony Robbins in his book mm -hmm. for our work on stem cells. <clears throat> and so, you know, when I can, I like to treat people with PRP because it's a heck of a lot cheaper. Um, I treat a lot of professional athletes, NFL athletes in particular. And a lot of times, a lot of times, a bigger factor than the PRP or the stem cells is how you handle the joint. And we get people whose joints are, um, um, are, are beaten up. I, I, I've, I've got, again, some high profile NFL people who were doing knee exercises that were aggravating the joint that, you know, shouldn't have been, um, or Achilles exercises. And I just say, just don't beat the joint up, let it heal. Um, <clears throat> and, and they get better. So, um, so I do PRP when I can for orthopedic problems, because it's so much cheaper and it's easier. And then in cases where, and, and for most musculoskeletal problems, it's good enough, you know, um, but where it isn't, then we can use stem cells. Amazing. Um, my experience is, it might, might make you laugh, but in microneedling on the face is great for the skin and collagen production. And you can add PRP to the microneedling and the healing for me was like a third or a half the time after a procedure like that, um, for increasing collagen. And I was really impressed. Um, one thing, then the next step with those, again, this is different from orthopedics, but I'm curious because now the, um, the derm, the estheticians are often using exosomes. Have you done any work with exosomes at all in this realm? Or uh, No, I'll be careful what I say here, mm -hmm. but exosomes are not like allowed in the US. You may or may not know this, but they're not. Um, and so we don't do anything that isn't FDA approved. We go offshore. We have a, st a stem cell center in Antigua. We have one in Monterey, Mexico, and we operate a full licensure there. So um, so if I use exosomes, no. Um, okay. And um, and... and so, so, so amniotic fluid mm -hmm. is allowed, um, but it's not really exosomes yeah. or really stem cells. And sometimes people play fast and loose a little bit with terminology. Yeah. Um, so from my perspective, uh, if I could use exosomes in the US, I would do it, but I can't. And if I'm going to bring people offshore to do it anyway, um, I'd rather use stem cells. And I'll tell you an interesting yeah. thing. So we're very evidence-based. We publish extensively in good um, journals 
Um, so there are only two studies. If you look at PubMed under exosomes, there's only two studies that exist. One was in long COVID where it didn't do any good. So the thing, the problem I have with exosomes is one, they're not allowed. And two, there's no evidence that they do any good. Now, I'm not saying they don't. And I'm talking legit exosomes, but there's lots of literature on stem cells. So we do those. And sometimes exosomes are kind of like stem cell light. You see, exosomes kind of fit the pharma model, which dominates yeah. everything. Yeah. Which is you, you make something wholesale, you sell it resale, uh, retail, people inject it like a drug. The thing with stem cells is, and, and, and so see, real exosomes are probably useful, but exosomes, in my opinion, are just a more expensive PRP. So we do PRP for $750. It's kind of a lot of money, but the usual exosome model is you buy a bottle of these things, a doctor does for 1500 bucks from somebody, and then you sell it to a patient for 3000 bucks. And, you know, maybe it works, but it's a lot more expensive. And there's no data anywhere that indicates that it works even as well as PRP. You know, like maybe it does, yes. um, <clears throat> as opposed to stem cells where there's lots of data. So I think the push for exosomes is dominated more by economic it's reasons and other things. And, you know, when and if there's data showing that it really works yeah. and that it's cost effective and when it's legal, I use it. But in the meantime, I don't. That makes so much sense. I actually love that you clarified, even for me, because it, I love the evidence-based foundation that you're on. Um, so tell us a little bit about the studies around PRP and stem cells and what kind of outcomes they've seen. Kind of the so we get, so, so taking all comers, we get people, and, and I'll tell you something, uh, you know, you mentioned drugs that are useful or indicated in surgery that's useful, but I'll tell you, most of the prescriptions that are out there, at least in my field, are not only not useful, they're bad for people. Um, and a tremendous amount of orthopedic surgery, in my opinion, is sort of unnecessary now. And I'm not the only one who feels that way. Um, so just to, I'll give you a few examples. Um, so I spent made my living fixing ACLs and fixing rotator cuffs. If a rotator cuff is completely torn, it detaches, it retracts, you have to reattach it. Yeah. So no stem cell is going to help that. Right. Um, although there are people using stem cells for that, but it doesn't help. Um, but most rotator cuff disorders are 90 plus percent are not complete tears or partial tears. So we published a paper, 65 or 70 patients, minimum two year follow up using PRP. And none of the patient, patients wound up needing surgery, minimum two year follow up. Um, um, and uh, none of them completed the tear. So a lot of those people are operated on by colleagues of mine. Why? I mean, they mean well and they want to help people. But, you know, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks yeah. like a nail. So, yeah. you know, if what you're doing is surgery, you operate on people. But the fact is that partial tears of the rotator cuff, which is most of them, surgery doesn't help. And studies have shown this. And I just didn't do it for, you know, for that reason. So uh, shoulder problems. Most of them rotator cuff would do well. Um, arthritis. So we just had a, a study it was presented at the International Cartilage Repair Society in Berlin last June, just accepted the publication in the good journal. 568 knees, three to seven year follow-up. It's a huge study, the, yeah. the likes of which hardly anybody does. Um, and um, so what we found was that taking all comers, and these were all total joint replacement candidates, 80% of the people wound up not needing joint replacements, minimum three year follow-up. Even And we stratified our results by how many millimeters of joint space there were, even the bone-on-bone -bone people. So you think, and a lot of people think, right, it, man, it's bone-on-bone, -bone. Yeah. ball game's over, I need surgery, right? right? Not so. So 65% of the people, bone-on-bone, -bone, minimum three-year follow-up did not need joint replacements. If they had just two millimeters of joint space, the number went up to 80%. If they had four millimeters or more of joint space, which is a noticeably abnormal x-ray, but not real severe, 100% of them did pretty well. So we get people from all over coming to us where people have told them they need joint replacements and they don't, and they do well. And we do, usually without stem cells, usually it's PRP. There are a number of nutritional supplements that help in the knee. We use hyaluronic acid. The one place where we, even bone on bone, terrible shoulders, terrible knees, um, Bone on bone hips don't do well um, with traditional PRP. We're actually starting a protocol, which is only available now to people for the Department of Defense. It's a very interesting protocol using lymphocytes to break down scar tissue. We're doing our first two patients in Monterey, Mexico in about a month, um, where even bad hips we expect, um, uh, expect to respond. So um, the short answer is tendon problems, um, um, arthritis, um, most people don't need surgery. Now I'll tell you another interesting fact. So I'm independent. 
When I started 38 years ago, everybody was independent pretty much. Okay. Now, very few people are. So if you're an orthopedic surgeon and you're working for a corporation, mo I wouldn't say most of them, but a lot of the people that I know are not allowed to do PRP, at least around here. So they're told that they're there to operate. And if they want PRP or something else non-surgical, they've got to send it off to somebody else. So this puts people in kind of a difficult situation. I have the luxury, people don't need surgery. I'll send them to therapy, I'll do PRP, I'll do other things. But it's increasingly difficult for orthopedic surgeons today to embrace non-surgical treatment just kind of for economic reasons. Yeah. You know, I want to just comment on that because for those listening, we in medicine, when you say that, I get it because I'm the same way. And if you go to an HMO, I won't mention any names, but an HMO or some of these organizations, those docs, they might have very good intentions and even know there's better options than just a prescription or surgical um, referral, but they're not allowed within that system to do that. And for you and I, I don't work for the insurance company. I don't work for any of those people. I get to decide with the patient in front of me, what's the best thing for you and what can you afford and how can we make this happen? And then we get to decide together and there's no other person in every other hospitals, you know, these groups, what were you're saying and what I'm seeing as well is there are a lot of other factors that sadly influence even the well-meaning physician. And I like that you say that because that's the truth, because a lot of people are, why didn't they offer me, you know, Boswellia or curcumin or something natural? Like, well, they either didn't know it or they couldn't talk about it in that system. It's, it's got, it's Orwellian. Mm -hmm. So people, one of the main purposes of EMRs, which people don't realize is it allows administrators and higher ups to monitor every phone call you make, every prescription you do. And doctors now, I have a friend who had a patient with a total cholesterol of 203, which by itself means almost nothing. Right. And right. she didn't, she's actually a, a functional doctor now working for a hospital corporation. She didn't offer a stat and then she got dinged. They said, well, dear doctor, shouldn't you have offered something? It's terrible. What, I'll tell you an interesting anecdote which shows yeah. how bad it's gotten. <laughs> so we have success with stem cells, with retinal disease. Macular degeneration, wow. amazing stuff. So we need, a, it's a retinal scan for people. Mm -hmm. So we had a patient with Kaiser um, from California who consulted us and we needed this retinal scan. So um, the, um, um, the, the, the doc, it had been refused by the powers that be. So I told the patient. Yeah. So the patient went and made an appointment with the ophthalmologist. You know why? because they didn't want to have a phone call and they didn't want to have an email or a text because it could be monitored. Right. So they behind closed doors told the doctor why they wanted. The doctor made up a rationale and prescribed it, but they were afraid to do it through normal channels because they would have gotten dinged and maybe even gotten in trouble. Oh, that's so sad. And you're like, this is why again, doctors are frustrated because as we know better and know more, we're still in an old antiquated system that doesn't allow for this free thinking. Now you mentioned, I know I do functional business. I do a lot of integrative uh, herbs and things that I know are anti-inflammatory. Talk a little bit about NSAIDs, narcotics, the kinds of things we do for pain and why they're maybe not healthy. And then what are some things that you use as alternatives? Yeah, so there are no prescription drugs that are good for orthopedics, none. So we get people off of NSAIDs always. NSAIDs do three things that are bad. They mask pain. And we see people, uh, and I, I could show you some interesting videos, people come in in chronic pain on NSAIDs. And the people that are really red hot are the people that are taking those because they mask pain, they hurt themselves yeah. and they don't know it. We stop those drugs and they get better. Mm -hmm. So number one, they mask pain. Number two, they interfere with healing in a significant way. There was a study that showed that if you gave people Celebrex after rotator cuff repair, the re-tear rate went from 3% to 37% at one year. These are potent anti-healing drugs. Yeah. The third thing is they're incredibly toxic an estimated 16,000 deaths every year in the U.S., from the New England Journal of Medicine article on the side effects of these drugs. So we get everybody off them. We never use them. Now, um, so, um, so supplements. So we did a deep dive, our research people, um, four years ago or so, into supplements. And we looked for PubMed indexed journals, good journals, articles, clinical trials, not animals, um, of uh, supplements against placebo controlled studies to see what, what was helpful. So it turns out there are 12 supplements that have shown some efficacy for arthritis. So we rank the 12 in declining order of efficacy. So we prescribe part of our algorithm for people with knee arthritis. We use hyaluronic acid, which is happily paid for and has been shown in studies to help for the knee, not other joints. We do PRP and we do supplements. So the ones that we use in, in declining orders, so the ones that have shown most to least data, glucosamine and chondroitin is number one. 
<clears throat> Boswellic acid in one form or another is number two, made from frankincense. Um, number three is curcumin. Number four is pycnogenol. Number five is type two collagen, not type one, but type two. And then there's some others. So we prescribe these for everybody. And, and doing that algorithm, we have, we have great success. But, but I'll tell you something else that is just horrific antidepressants, right? So 100 million antidepressant prescriptions written in the US last year. This is a horrible and evil and insidious epidemic. Antidepressants, people are often scared into taking these things because they say, well, you know, you're depressed and maybe they'll hurt yourself or your loved one will hurt themselves. So there's a black box warning on all these antidepressants. They say for people 25 and under, but I think it's everybody, that antidepressants increase the incidence of suicidal ideation. And there's a recent study out of Sweden showing it isn't just ideation, there are actually more suicides among them, right? So, so the people have done short-term studies, which seem to indicate that these things have pain-killing properties. And in my opinion, they don't. So we get people off of these things. They're addictive. Once you're on them, you're hooked. It's like an opiate. It's horrible, in my opinion. And then opiates, we never use opiates. We don't use any prescription drugs. There are none that are good for musculoskeletal problems. Wow. I love that. I love that you're so clear because, again, I see that in my practice. And often I'm having the same discussions with patients on these meds because they do, they have downstream effects. There's no one who's born with a serotonin deficiency. <laughs> this is not, and, and the science has come out since then, since the pharmaceuticals have sold us this bill, as far as the reality of neurotransmitters. And it's not the story we were told 20 years ago. Well, as you allude to, so the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, you probably know about a year ago, they found out it doesn't even do that. Yes. You know? And it's, it's, it's nuts. What it does do is cause changes in your brain. We work a lot. We do stem cell treatments. We've got a couple of NFL quarterbacks, for example. And one of the things it does is helps their focus. It helps yeah. their sleep. And we work with, um, with uh, Tim Royer, who works with a lot of professional athletes, great sleep person. And all drugs, all drugs, all drugs that influence sleep they, they induce sleep, induce artificial sleep. And yes. he doesn't use them at all, right? So I don't think anybody should use them, but it's, you know, it's like an, an easy way out. Mm -hmm. And in particular, these, um, in, in particular, these antidepressants. Yeah, and in the sad thing you alluded to too, as you talk about our medical colleagues and stuff that are stuck in these systems, um, one of the things that often happen is if doc has someone who feels sad or anxious or can't sleep or depressed or symptoms, or maybe just pain or inflammation, they don't know what to do. They're not looking for root cause like you and I are doing. So their default is, oh, well, maybe you need an antidepressant because we don't know, we call it functional, not functional medicine, but functional disorders, which are actually just that we don't know, um, idiopathic, we don't know what's happening. Now, you and I know there's root cause, but the average doc maybe who doesn't have that answer will just say, well, let's try an antidepressant. Well, and they're put into a box because as you probably exactly. know, doctors now working for corporations get fired, terminated mm -hmm. for low productivity, right? And it's been shown that the way to see people faster is to give them drugs. Yes. So you get them in, you say, hey, you know, right. this is that's what here's the drug, see you later. To yeah. actually take time, to, to, to talk about lifestyle, which is yeah. vastly more important, is time consuming. Right. And it doesn't fit in to the modern model of corporate medicine. So right. these docs, a lot of times are put into a box of almost having to do this. Couldn't agree more. Um, so future of medicine, you're obviously on the forefront um, and seeing some of these things. Where do you think is, where is the research headed? Where are things headed with your field and what you're doing? Well, so let me talk to you about stem cells a little bit. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so we, um, I'll tell you some of the things we're doing and some of the things we found. And every patient we treat is part of a prospective study. Every patient is followed up by our research team. We do tests before and after. So autism, we have um, nine patients so far in the clinical trial for autism. They all got better. One regressed after a, um, a matter of weeks, but the others have gotten better and stayed better. And we have a testimonial from a doctor who's a leader in autism nationwide and MD whose son, and she put this out there for our use, who has gotten off of risperidone, an antipsychotic, you know, and it stayed off it. So we have great success with autism. It's a very simple thing. It's just infused, a simple IV infusion, very well tolerated. People we have as old as 27, as young as four. So autism has been fantastic. Aut autism is an immune mediated disorder, which is, you know, kind of explains why stem cells work. Uh, back pain, we've got a clinical trial of 39 patients so far with at least a couple of months follow-up. 
80% plus have had great success. Wow. These are people who have failed surgery, people with terrible problems. Um, so we do stem cells in the facet joints, in the epidural space, occasionally into the disc. Um, back surgery is, you know, there are times when you really need it, but has a tremendous failure wow. rate. And when back surgery fails, it tends to fail spectacularly. A lot of, you know, drug addicted people, right? So we've had great success doing that. We do peripheral joints, knees and shoulders, but most of the time we don't need to because PRP works well. Um, we have great success with autoimmune disorders. I work with a doctor um, in, in Buenos Aires, Argentina and Monterey, who's developed a vaccine for MS. 200 treated patients um, with more than 20 year follow-up, um, 80% plus, it, you, 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 it's a vaccine made from your own T cells. So your T cells are removed, removed by apheresis. Yep. He's able to identify the cells that are attacking your oligodendrocytes and then um, activate them with neural antigens and then kill them and reinfuse them. And 10 to 12 vaccine shots, yep. it's completely safe, no serious adverse events. It goes away and it stays gone. He's got 20 year follow up. Wow. It's just remarkable. Doesn't exactly fit the pharma model, right? Right. right. You know, phar pharma is great. They help a lot of people, but they have no interest in this treatment because they can't monetize it and they can't patent it, right? So MS, spinal cord injured people. We have people paraplegics, 80 paraplegics and quadriplegics treated. And we get people in wheelchairs who get out of wheelchairs and walk. It's remarkable using, using stem cells. And again, if we had more time, the venue was different. I could show you videos of people. We've got people right now in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where we do this, um, who, 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 I, one lady now from Seattle, well to do lady who fell and couldn't stand up and is now standing after only a month. It wow. takes six months to get people better. So, spinal cord injury, eye disease, macular degeneration, um, retinal disease, uh, other autoimmune disorders, scleroderma. We've got two scleroderma patients now. One <clears throat> had severe uh, lung disease, which scleroderma patients yeah. can have. After four months of treatment, CAT scan completely clear, breathing easier, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, horrible, universally fatal disease. You just suffocate to death. We got a couple of patients in a protocol for that. Uh, one, it stabilized. Another one was on six liters of oxygen down to two liters of oxygen, um, you know, um, uh, breathing better. So, you know, you asked me for a title of this and I said revolutionizing disease treatment. Yeah. And you're thinking, wow, that sounds kind of stuck up, right? But but it's oh. it's really real. It's just amazing what this technology um, is is capable of doing. Amazing, amazing, and it makes sense because a lot of the things you're describing are these overactive. It's our innate immune system has gotten confused with all the signals outside, whether it's chemicals or toxins or infections. And so many of these diseases you're describing are an overactive T cell population. And I'm assuming that stem cell comes in and really just re-regulates the immune signaling. Well, exactly. we do. Is it, there's 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 three different um, things that are involved. The one is we can just inject the stem cells, yeah. and in the case of autism, that's good enough. I mean, they're not cured, but people yeah. get reliably better. We can inject stem cells for rheumatoid arthritis, for MS, a lot of them, and they'll suppress it in many cases, but it tends to come back and it doesn't work in all cases. So we use T cell vaccines, and I'm using that more and yeah. more, which is more complicated. You get apheresis, it takes about a week. Yep. You get apheresis, you take these cells out, um, as I was just describing for MS. You can do it for inflammatory bowel disease, for rheumatoid arthritis, polymyalgia, rheumatica, type 1 diabetes. Um, and then a vaccine is made and it's put back, but you have to do it monthly for a while. And the last thing is what we call effector cells. So we'll take lymphocytes out, um, <clears throat> say for the central nervous system. So these lymphocytes are challenged with neural antigens. They're injected back. So what happens when you damage tissue that doesn't normally heal, central nervous system or heart or retina or hair cells in the ear is for two weeks, it's in a phase of healing called TH1, where it can heal with stem cells. After that, it modulates to Th2, T helper two, and scar tissue is laid down over it. Wow. Stem cells can't get to it. So by injecting these lymphocytes, they seek out this area of inflammation where the scar tissue is, and they partially reverse it and get rid of some of the scar tissue. Then we co-culture those T those um, lymphocytes uh -huh. with stem cells from you that we've taken before and grown, and they partially. So in 48 hours, these activated lymphocytes will partially differentiate your own adipose-derived stem cells into neural progenitor cells. They're like they're like nerve cells. Uh -huh. They're injected. They seek out these lymphocytes, which have labeled this tissue, uh -huh. which enables them to cross the blood-brain barrier. Because some of the scar tissue has been whittled away, they're able to help heal it, and and people start to heal. 
So we do that. A couple of days later, you go home, repeat this at intervals, and we can get um, the spine to heal. Um, we, we can get myocardium. We're just treating our first patients there to heal. It, I, I mean, it sounds like science fiction, I know, but it's real stuff. And we have documentation and we publish things um, about it. Amazing, amazing. And no, if to me, it doesn't because I've been following this world, but you're right. To some of our listeners, I'm sure this is just out there, but this is where the future is going. Root uh, cause and really using the techniques and the technology that we have to optimize human performance, resilience, and, and healing. Um, Let me talk to you about something else in that regard too. So the obvious question is, well, gee, number one, if this is so great, why isn't everybody doing it? And number two, if it's so great, why isn't it FDA approved? So mesenchymal stem cells, these are not embryonic, these are not fetal, these are not aborted. These are what we're called adult stem cells. So they're either from you as an adult, or they could be from a newborn whose umbilical cord is donated. Um, these were more or less discovered in 1976. Um, and for decades, there was lots of research, good research, great success, very safe. It's not like people were dying from this, they weren't. 2005, the FDA decided in the EMA in Europe, they should regulate these. And why? Well, they said it could be unsafe and there are scams and one thing and another. So mm -hmm. fine. And so when this happened, they imposed the same standard on stem cells that is imposed on pharmaceutical drugs, which are double blind, randomized, placebo controlled studies. So if you talk to people from the FDA, and I, and I love the FDA and they try to help people, but they would say, yeah, they're legal, but you have to do an IND, investigational new drug protocol. The problem is these studies are $100 million studies. That money exists no place except pharma. Right. Pharma's great, but pharma can't patent this, can't monetize it. And so they don't do these studies. So the bottom line is the studies don't get done. So you can do it illegally in the United States. I'm not interested in breaking any laws. So what's happened is it's been driven offshore. So we have a center in Antigua where we have licensure to do it. We have one in Monterey, Mexico. There's other good ones in other places offshore. Um, but this is completely safe. We have had zero serious adverse events. And we know we follow up. Our patients get annoyed with us sometimes yeah. because we call them. We say, how are you doing? Right. And, you know, a lot of them want to know. Some of them say, why are you bothering me? Say, well, this is the only way we know is if we find out what's going on. And I spend a lot of money on this foundation um, that isn't supported by anything else, just so we can know what we're actually doing, you know? So my point is, this treatment is completely safe. Now, we have made it a point to study adverse events because there have been bad things that have happened to people with stem cells. What we have found in every case is that they come from one of two things, either um, bad doctors or bad cells, bad doctors, doctors doing it that don't really understand the field or cells that are made from a tissue bank that is a substandard place. So, but this can happen not in stem cells. You know, there was something like 30 patients died from fungal infections from cortisone from a yes. compound in pharmacy. You probably know about this, right? right. From right. a dirty lab. So, you know, you can do anything badly and have problems. But properly done stem cell treatment from a reputable lab is incredibly safe. Stem cells are what has evolved through time to help us heal ourselves. I mean, they can't be unsafe or we'd be yeah, extinct. Exactly, because they come from. Um, uh, Dr. Perdomas, this is amazing. And thank you. I just feel such gratitude for you for seeing the potential and then pouring your heart and mind and life into this because it really is leading the edge for all of us. Um, with the research. And I love your commitment to data and to collecting research, because that's what's going to move this forward in our current system is continuing to collect the data. Um, where can people find you more information about your clinic or clinics? And uh, um, so, I mean, you could Google me if you can spell my name, but it's, yeah. uh, it's a hard Greek name, Prodromos, P-R-O-D-R-O-M-O-S. Right. Um, but we have two things. We have, a, I mean, I can give you a phone number and URL sure. if you want, but our, our phone number is um, 847-699-6810. That gets you into the system. And if you call if you call about stem cells or whatever, we've got a, we've got a terrific team actually. Um, and then um, our stem cell institute, we have a nonprofit too, but the stem cell institute is the thepsci.com. Um, so it's the Perdomo stem cell institute.com. So T-H-E psci.com. If you go there, there's an email care at the psci.com. So you, you get a real person, not a phone bank. Again, we've got a great team. Uh, we love answering questions. We evaluate people at, at no charge. Amazing. And I will link if you're listening to this audio or seeing us on video, you'll be able to find the links to these wherever you're listening. Um, thank you again. I want to say something else because you have a nonprofit. I know there's a lot of docs and other people that have means that would, I, I love the idea of supporting your work. Where could people um, get information about supporting your foundation? 
So the foundation, it's the form. So it's the foundation for regenerative medicine. So it's the T H E F O R E M dot org. Perfect. And it has its own website. And you can make tax deductible donations to that that support our research or can be put into a fund to we deal with you know, children with cerebral palsy and other things who don't have means um, into a fund that is used to help pay for treatment for people who can't afford it. I love that. Love, love, love that. Well, um, hopefully we'll have more conversations. Maybe next time we'd have you share some of the video. Dr. Perdomas, this has been a delight and a joy. I know our listeners have enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much for your time. Jill, thank you for the opportunity. And I, I, I commend you on doing what you're doing to spread good information. Thank you.